Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you, for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What kind of love is this? That is our series for the season of Lent and also for Easter Sunday. What kind of love is this that we ask that God would love us so much to pour out his life for us? I want us to explore the text this morning. Our brother Paul has written to the church at Corinth, and this is the second Corinthians letter. It's actually probably the third or later letter, but we're reading it today, and I want you to hear it in full context. I also want to invite you, if you have your Bibles open, to begin at chapter 9 and verse 1. I'll be reading that in a moment, so have that ready. But I want to say a word to those persons who might be visiting with us for the first time. First of all, we are so happy you're here, and today is a conversation that we are having in the life of the church family. It is an official day that we make a commitment for our stewardship emphasis for our fiscal budget that is July 1 through June 30th. And so I want you to understand that we know that you are a guest here today and that we are not expecting you necessarily to be at the altar this morning with your pledge card. However... Should the Holy Spirit speak, we praise God for that. But I wanted you to know that this morning. And also I want to say a word about gratitude for those who have already turned in their estimate of giving commitment cards so that we would have that, so that we would know that today. And as we listen to our brother Paul talk to the church, it is my prayer that I will be able to share words with you of encouragement and inspiration and hope because Johns Creek United Methodist Church has great things in store, and God is providing all that we need and will provide all that we need for that future. So I praise God for that. So what kind of love is this? We ask ourselves that question when we are on the receiving end of the grace and gifts of Jesus Christ, who gives his life for us. I want us to think this morning about generosity. I don't preach every Sunday lengthy sermons on money. And and I'll say something about that a little bit later, but I want you to know that today is a focus time, and the letter that Paul has written to the church helps us understand what we're doing and where we are in our generosity. You and I love to give to people that we love. It's true. And we don't mind being on the receiving end. And overflowing generosity comes right out of this text today, but we also feel that love because God has given us so much. We are so blessed. I think about all the different ways in which God has enriched our lives, and they are numerous. I I think about yesterday the, the desire that we have to give to people we love. We spent yesterday with our two and a half year old Uh, granddaughter last Saturday and then yesterday our three and a half year old granddaughter so I have been in Mimi heaven and yesterday we spent about six hours and we had a wonderful time and we played and we ran and we climbed and we did things and I realized that my body has muscles in it I didn't know it had any of you have ever played with a little child and you the next day you wake up and say oh wow I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh, but I am when it comes to those grandchildren. And we do show up with gifts. We're grandparents who don't miss an opportunity to do that. I'm not saying that everybody has to do that, but I just can't resist giving something of love and some kind of gift to my grandchildren every time I get a chance. And so yesterday we took a few gifts. And as I was thinking about that, the sermon was already written, but I was reflecting on that Uh, on the way home, and I thought about how I just couldn't help myself. Have you ever loved someone so much that even though it wasn't a birthday or an anniversary or a 
special day that you just had to do something loving and generous for them. I'm sure you have. I know that I have. And that's what love does to us. We can't help ourselves. We want to do what we can to be loving and generous. And so I want us to think about that because Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth. And some of you will remember that Corinth is a seaport town in what we know in modern day Greece. It's the Achaia region. Some people read the text and they think, who is Achaia? But it's the area. So I wanted to be sure to mention that this morning. We're in the middle of a conversation here with Paul and the church that he founded, a church that he loves. And so as we think about what's going on with the Corinthians, Paul also is very loving and and he may be prone, like any preacher, to repeat himself or herself. We're going to see that in just a moment. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to share with you uh, beginning at verse 1 in chapter 9. Paul writes to them, Now it is not necessary for me to write you about the ministry to the saints. Now I want to stop there. He says it's not necessary, but guess what Paul does? He's writing a letter anyway. Have you ever had to say to someone, I don't need to remind you, but... So he continues, For I know your eagerness, which is the subject of my boasting about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you may not prove to have been empty in this case. Now he's putting on the guilt trip. Now, I want you to know that your pastor is about grace, not guilt. But if the text fits, well, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you in this undertaking. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for this bountiful gift that you have promised, so that it may be ready as a voluntary gift and not as an extortion. Paul is speaking very specifically here about the collection for the church in Jerusalem. And I want to say a word about that. This is something they've already agreed to. It's very reminiscent of what we do when we join the church and we say to God, I will love and support and uphold my vows here in this congregation with my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. Paul's reminding the church they've already agreed to the collection in Jerusalem, and it's voluntary. Then at verse 6, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, We need to be happy about this, not grumbling and grouchy. I don't give to my children and grandchildren and the people I love and say, well, here, take this, hope you like it. No, we're so happy to give and to offer that love. So Paul reminds them, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Friends, do you hear the Apostle Paul? God has given us everything and above and beyond anything we could have imagined. We are so blessed. Verse 9, as it is written, He scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. Do you hear the excitement and the hope that is in Paul's heart? Do you know why he has that? He's counting on the church to be the church. Think about that. He's counting on the church to be who they are supposed to be. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is very important for us to hear that this morning. We take vows. We know that our generosity is based on our obedience. We just heard the beautiful anthem, 
this is what we believe. We believe who God is. And then I love this part in verse 14. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given for you. The folks in Jerusalem are praying for the people in Corinth and the people in Corinth are praying for the folks in Jerusalem. I want to remind us as United Methodists today that we are a part of the global family. What we do, who we are, where we serve touches all around the world. We are part of the global family and the people in Corinth will likely never see the people in Jerusalem. There are missions and ministries that we do where we may not personally get to meet that person. But also we have the joy of seeing the faces of joy on persons that we are able to give to. So it is a both and. And then we think about this image. While they long for you and pray for you because of surpassing grace of God that he has given you, then he says these words in verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Would you say that with me? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. With all the magnificent poetry and music and art and conversation, we are inadequate in our words to express the beauty and power of who God is in Jesus Christ. The love that he has for us. What kind of love is this? It is generous love. It is overflowing love. God so loves us, the whole world, that we ought to be overflowing in our love. Not resentfully, not begrudgingly, but joyfully, cheerfully. So I want us to think about that this morning, and then I want us to think about the image of not under compulsion, about free will. God gifts us with free will. The pledge police will not be knocking on your door, just so you know. This is a conversation and a prayer and a hope that everyone will do what is right in their heart in God's eyes. That is our prayer. And also, what I like is that there are no excuses on Paul's part that the need is there. Friends, look at where we are. Look around. Listen to who we are. The gifts that God has given Johns Creek, I am so honored and proud to be the pastor of such a generous church. And we have amazing days ahead of us, amazing opportunities ahead of us. This free will is very important in those days. I want us to also think about when people say, oh, Pastor, I don't like to come to church when they're talking about money. I think it's often reflected in our attendance on Commitment Sunday when people say, oh, look at that, I've got to be somewhere else today. That's not applying to you because you're here. But I think about how we need to be joyful about it, how we need to know that it's important. And I don't do this every Sunday. I don't have a focused sermon on giving. I spend my time talking about our discipleship, but this is part of our discipleship. I have been here almost nine months, and it's like having a baby. No, there are no announcements here. It's like having a baby, and it's time for Johns Creek for a new birth. We have a new vision. We have a new opportunity. If you haven't seen what is ahead for us, I invite you to look on our website or on your JCUMC app and look at the vision video that our lay people presented, born and birthed out of our listening sessions and our moments and our conversations and our planning and our laity presenting the dreams for our church, a vision that we believe God has put in our heart to focus in three major groups of areas, worship, music, and the arts. And I will say that we are excited about those opportunities. We are focusing on children and youth. They are high priority in our congregation. We are focusing on our small groups and education and Sunday school and Stephen ministry and serving and service and outreach to our community. When you listen to the vision and see that it's online on our website, you will be excited if you haven't already. I I know people say, oh, I don't want to come to church on a Sunday and talk about money. Well, I need to educate us today if we didn't know it already. 33 parables that Jesus gave, 30 were about money. You need to talk to him about that. But I would say this, when people say, oh, I don't want to talk about money in church, I get that, I think you'd like a break, and here's why I think you'd like a break. You'd like a break because seven days are given to us each week, and six of them, what we do is talk about money. We check the stock market, we check the investments, we talk about business profit and loss, we talk about the ways that we are employed or need to be employed or who to hire or who to fire if we can keep our job. 
You know, I have a stock market app on my iPhone. We are always talking about how to spend it, how to earn it, how to save it, but we also need to be talking about how to give it away. And I want us to realize that in this sermon series through Lent and Easter, the theme has been what kind of love is this that God would give us the love in Jesus Christ, and each week there is a theme. And today is generous love because God has given that to us. But dear friends, I would say to you today and to myself, God is asking us that question this morning. What kind of love is this that you have for me, my children? What kind of love is this that you would make your giving decisions based on our relationship? I think God is saying that to us today. I think that very often in our lives we are in a consumer society, and I am a part of that as well. But I think that rather than God getting what's left over, we need to say, God, you're definitely first. And I'll make every decision and every priority and align it based on our relationship where you are first. My husband and I believe and practice the tithe. That's 10% of income. And we also believe that that is a base, not a ceiling. Uh, my granddaughters don't just get presents on birthday and Christmas. They get it every time I see them. And so it depends on the relationship, doesn't it? God says, what kind of love is this? I want us to realize here at Johns Creek that when we think about giving, that it's up to all of us. Somebody says, well, there's plenty of money out there. It's just in their pockets. Here's the problem with that. It's in all of our pockets. We don't need a them and, and us, a, a they. We need a we because we're only a we. What did our precious children sing this morning? We are the church together. Every single person counts. Every gift matters. And we ought to be the kind of people who say, I can't wait to say thank you to God. I have so much. We have this beautiful creation. We have a beautiful world. We have relationships, people to love. We have flowers. Now, some of you are allergic to them, and I'm sorry, I'm one of those too. But they're beautiful. We have pets and animals. By the way, has April the giraffe had her baby yet? No, I'm still waiting. I, I, I'm checking it every now and then. I'm, I'm busy, but I want to know. See, just the fact that we have life and creation is beautiful. If those of you who don't know what the rest of us are talking about, there is a giraffe that was supposed to deliver any minute three weeks ago. All right, now, there's something else I want to say about the importance of us doing this together with overflowing generosity. And I'll need your participation in this part of the message in a particular way. I'm going to share with you an obituary this morning, so I need you to help me to remember the name of the person that I'm saying. This obituary is about someone else. Can you say someone else? I will point to you when it is time. Here is the obituary. Our church was saddened to learn this week of the death of one of our most valued members, someone else. Someone's passing creates a vacancy that will be difficult to fill. Else has been with us for many years, and for every one of those years, someone did a far more than a normal person's share of the work. Whenever there was a job to do, a class to teach, or a meeting to attend, one name was on everyone's list. Let do it. Let someone else do it. Whenever leadership was mentioned, this wonderful person was looked to for inspiration as well as results. Someone else can work with that group. It was common knowledge that someone else was among the most liberal givers in our church. Whenever there was a financial need, everyone just assumed would make up the difference. Someone else was a wonderful person, sometimes appearing superhuman. Were the truth known, everybody expected too much of someone else. Now, someone else is gone. We wonder, what are we going to do? Someone else left a wonderful example to follow, but who is going to follow it? Who is going to do the things that someone else did? When you are asked to help this year, to give this year, to serve this year, remember, we can't just depend on someone else anymore. May they rest in peace. You see, there's a someone else in every church, in every setting, and we want to always be the someone who is helping and giving and serving and loving. You see, I want to encourage us in a positive way about that. Friends, we've got too much negativity in the world. 
people just whine. Have you noticed that? And then they drink some wine to go with it. But they just whine about things. They're negative. They're complaining. I don't like this. I don't like that. People even do it in churches. Can you even believe it? I don't like the temperature. I don't like the music. I don't like this. I don't like that. I have a sign in my office that says, Thou shall not whine. I know of a pastor, a story where a pastor put a thermostat in the back of the sanctuary because he had Miss Grouchy Whiner coming to her every... I don't, I don't like the temperature. It's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. And he would say, well, Miss Jones, would you just go back there and check that thermostat for us? She would do it and she'd say, oh, that's so much better. She never knew that it wasn't connected to anything but the sheetrock on the wall. Isn't it funny how people can just turn things positive or negative? We want to be those people of hope and cheerfulness and giving and love so that when we see what God can do far beyond our imagining, we have everything we need to do it for God's kingdom. And so for us today, dear ones, we need to decide what kind of givers we will be based on what we believe about Jesus, about his overflowing generous love in our lives and how we're going to respond to it. We don't need to go through life with a theology of scarcity but abundance. We have a more than enough. We are given all kinds of opportunities and sharing and being generous blesses us. It's good for our body chemistry. It's good for our mind and our spirit and it's most certainly good for God's kingdom. So I want us to realize that we can choose the good we can be positive. We can look for ways in which we might bless people. Someone else came up with the phrase, blessed to be a blessing, and I often sign things with that. It was a stewardship theme in a church I served once called blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed so that we can bless others. And I'm so ready for this new next phase, this new birth in our church, and that's going to be up to all of us, not just someone else. I want us to hear again before we sing our closing hymn of discipleship and bring forward the commitment cards. I want to remind us today that when God asks us, what kind of love is this that you have for me? We will be joyful. Our hearts will be overflowing with love. And we won't be in a position where we're negative or stingy or anything else, but that we're joyful and generous. For Paul says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That's God's promise to us. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. That honors God. That fills God's heart with love. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Dear friends, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And may the Lord bless us and keep us and keep us serving and being generous. And may that overflow to everyone that we know. In his holy name we pray. That's what kind of love this is. Amen.